<laughs> That's right. I'll tell you who's the boss, quick time. All right. So this was your warm-up. Example four, um, first of all, looking at it, it's a definite integral, right? What kind of definite integral? Improper. Definitely improper, right? What makes it improper? Right, we got an infinity as a, as a boundary. So, uh, again, as a free response, you got to learn the notation. It has to come from a limiting process. So, uh, look, this is uh, they're calling me again. This is the fourth time. Limit as B goes to negative infinity. There's Corpy. <laughs> the integral from B to zero of, and then I'll bring this to the top, three minus X to the one half power negative. Yeah, DX. Uh, when I answered it, it beeped. Okay. Um, so now we have it set up. We have the limit in front. We've replaced negative infinity with, again, an arbitrary variable. We typically use B. Um, and I brought my uh, factor to the top so I can integrate it by pattern recognition. So uh, the inside function would be 3 minus x, and its derivative is what? Zero. Negative 1. Do we have a negative 1 outside? No. no, but is that a problem? No. no. We just have a negative 1 correction. And don't forget, we still have the limit there, negative infinity. And so now the rule of integration is blob to the negative 1 half. So we leave a little space. It's a power rule. We add 1 to get a half. Instead of dividing by a half, we multiply by 2. Put the blob in there. No plus C is needed. We evaluate it from B to nothing. All right, so uh, I'm going to start a new column here. So now we got the limit as B goes to negative infinity. Our new coefficient is negative 2, beefy burnt orange bracket. There we go. There we go. Um, now we'll plug in the top minus plug in the bottom. So 3 minus 0 is 3, so I get the square root of 3. Minus, plug in a B, I get uh, 3 minus B to the 1 half power, which I'll go ahead and write as the square root of 3 minus B. The 3 is not showing up. Come on. There we go. Um, and so there is the expression, which now we can evaluate. So remember, you can just reproduce the limit as many times as you need, put it in front of any variable that you have, and evaluate it. So let's go ahead and... Uh, Ooh, sorry. Yeah, we're approaching negative infinity. So what would happen if we essentially use direct substitution? We plug in a negative infinity for B, we get 3 minus negative infinity is plus infinity. What's 3 plus infinity? infinity? Infinity. What's the square root of infinity? Infinity. What's the square root of 3 minus infinity? Negative infinity. What's negative infinity times negative 2? Positive infinity. Yeah, so that's the answer. So um, you can leave that as an answer if this were a free response. The free response question might actually ask you, does the integral converge or diverge? In this case, you would say diverge. And you can actually say it diverges to, maybe towards would be a better word, right? It diverges towards infinity. But two is fine. Um, and again, if this were a multiple choice question, you're either going to have like infinity and negative infinity as answer choices, or you'll have three numeric answers with an answer choice of divergence. Now, is there a way that you probably could have guessed that without having to go through the work? Yeah, you really could have. It's from negative infinity to zero, and it's one over three minus x to the one-half power. So as we were saying yesterday, this is not a p-series, right, because we're not going from some positive a to infinity, um, but we are kind of going out to a certain type of infinity. We're going out to the left, so as it approaches a horizontal asymptote going out to the left, it's kind of really the same question as, as to how it goes out to the right, and it's not a perfect x to the one-half power, but it's a transformation of an x to the one-half power in the denominator, right? So it belongs to the same family of worthless, lazy x-axis approachers right? It belongs to the x to the 1 half family, which we saw yesterday um, as it approaches the x-axis because p is, is 1 half, which is less than or equal to 1, it would diverge. So that intuition is going to serve you well on multiple choice questions. 
okay? Um, especially when we get to sequences and series. If this were a multiple choice question, you could look at it and say, ah, we're going out to a horizontal asymptote, not up to the right, but to the left, and it belongs to the lazy one over x to the one half family, which diverges. So you know the answer is divergent immediately um, or plus or minus infinity. Now to figure out the sign, um, you could probably guess. Or yeah, you can kind of you can kind of see how it's approaching infinity or negative infinity by plugging in yeah a representative value. All right, plug in like a huge negative number and you'll see that it's positive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so very good, very good. So integrals such as the ones we've seen now from a to infinity or negative infinity to a or even negative infinity to infinity, we can have it going uh, to to infinity on both ends. Those are called improper integrals, not because, again, they lift boxes incorrectly or curse like a sailor, but because of one of the reasons. They have infinity as an interval of integration. Those are the ones we've seen. There are other, mm, there are other ways to get improper integrals, and these are a little bit harder to discover. If they don't have infinity as a limit of integration, the Scorpi, Um, they either have infinity as an upper or lower or both limit of integration. Those are easy to spot, right? When you look at the definite integral, you're not going to think, man, someone made their eight sideways, right? You're going to spot infinity. Um, the other ones are they have a discontinuity either on the interval of integration or I'll say or at an endpoint of integration. I need to add that on there as well. Now what does that mean? Usually, usually, if I could spell that, a vertical asymptote. Because we already saw like jump man. We can integrate jump man through the jump. It's not a problem. Same thing with like a removable point discontinuity. You can integrate right through those. It's the vertical asymptotes or the horizontal asymptotes, the asymptotes in general, which are, are one way or the other. We've already seen where it can converge or diverge, depending on how fast it approaches the asymptote. So, again, these are going to be a little bit harder to discover, as you'll see, because you don't have infinity as a limit of integration. You'll actually have two numbers, but the two numbers that you have, that interval, has a vertical asymptote either somewhere in between them for the function or at one of the endpoints. So a little bit harder to discover. And then you can have some that we call doubly improper, Right? That would be someone who holds up the hook and sign and says, factor, yeah. Right? They're doing both of them. You can have a discontinuity on the interior, a VA on the interior, and approach a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so there's the idea of converge and diverge. Let's go ahead and look at uh, example five. These are the improper integrals that are like number two. A little bit harder to spot. Okay? Oh, wait. Um, Sorry, we're, we're reviewing. I didn't read. Improper integrals with an infinite interval of integration are easy to spot. Okay, there we go. We can see that right there, infinity. Now, we've already done this one, right? We knew it converged, and it converged to – we did it numerically, right? Yeah, we have good memory, 0.367. So we'll go ahead and um, verify that analytically, and we'll find the exact value, which should be equal to the decimal version we found. So again, let's practice the, uh, the free response notation. Uh, we got to write it as the limit as b goes to infinity from 1 to b of e to the negative x dx. So now we'll just rewrite the limit until we evaluate it. e to the negative x, its antiderivative is? Good, negative e to the negative x. And that negative up front is something that some people might miss, right? We have an inside function that's more than x. It's negative x. It generates an unwanted negative, so we correct it. Uh, and we evaluate it from 1 to b. So we got the limit now as b goes to infinity. And again, even though it's just a negative 1, I'm going to keep it out front. So I get e to the negative b minus e to the negative 1. And now I can evaluate it. Um, here's the limit. Here's my factor, term, whatever, with the uh, b. What happens to uh, e to the negative b as b goes to infinity? It's the same as 1 over e to the b, remember? So it does go to 0. Yeah, it goes to zero. So once we evaluate it, we could drop it, the limit, and we replace it with zero minus, uh, I'll just call that one over E. I like that a little bit better. 
and a negative times a negative is a positive. So there's 1 over E. And now I'll take out the calculator. I won't go to the one on the screen, but I have one right here. You can hear it. 1 divided by E. E you can get by hitting second negative. Instead of hitting second LN to the first, just second negative. And guess what it is? It's 0 0.36787944412. And, of course, we kind of found that numerically with the calculator up above. But now we have the exact answer, 1 over E, which is better, right? We don't have to round or, or, or truncate. Okay, so again, your intuition should tell you in the beginning that, yeah, for sure that thing is going to converge, right? Because anything, remember, that goes to the x-axis faster than 1 over x to the first is going to converge. And by the big O function, we know that exponentials in the denominator grow faster than power functions in the denominator. So it's going to work. All right, so let's look at this one. Negative infinity to zero of e to the positive x to the fourth. What does your intuition tell you? Converge or diverge? Should converge, right? Now, if we were going out to the right, that would diverge very quickly, right? Because e to the x fourth is going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of four of the graph of e to the x. So if I started at zero and went to infinity, whoa, man, that area is going to get really large really fast. That diverges to, like, infinity squared, right? But because I'm going to the left, it's going to converge. Um, so if this were a multiple choice question, we could get rid of the uh, diverges answer choice, and we got it down to one and three now. But we'll go ahead and work it out. Um, you want to do this one free response style or multiple choice style? Free response style? Okay. Okay. I was kind of hoping for the other, but no, that's all right. We, we've only done one with a lower limit of integration. We might as well practice it one more time. The limit as b goes to negative infinity, the integral from b to 0, and then um, e to the x fourths, dx. All right. So now we've got that set up. We've got to write the limit again. What is the antiderivative of e to the x fourths? Good. 4e to the x fourths, because uh, the inside function is x fourths, which is 1 fourth x. It generates an unwanted 1 fourth. So the reciprocal is 4 uh, from b to 0. Uh, rewrite the limit each time. 4 out front for me, whatever you do, be careful, beefy brackets. We get e to the 0, which is 1, minus e to the b fourths. And now, of course, we can evaluate the limit of that second term. And if we plugged in a negative infinity, we can still evaluate it by direct substitution. We just can't write e to the negative infinity divided by 4. But negative infinity divided by 4 is negative infinity, right? And e to the negative infinity power is like 1 over e to the infinity, which goes to 0. So this approach is uh, 4. So you can just write 4. It's your answer. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, what did I say? It's a, it's, it's a horizontal stretch by a factor of 4, not compression. That was my bad. I misspoke at the beginning. Because it's a 1 fourth for a B value. It's the opposite of what's here. So it's not a fourth as wide. It's 4 times wider, which is why we have a relatively large area, even though it's an exponential function. We're stretching it, which flattens it out a little bit, takes some of the steepness out. Okay, how about this guy? Yeah, so what is it? I know it already. Do you know it already? Yeah, it's infinity. Or it diverges to infinity. Now, let's prove it. Right. There's a couple ways to figure this one out. You can remember what we did in the beginning. This one is actually, though, a P-series. It's perfectly a P-series because we're going from 1 to infinity, and it's of the form, we did this yesterday, 1 over x to the pth power. And remember, if P is less than or equal to 1, it diverges. If P is greater than 1, it converges. And so 1 is the gatekeeper, right? And then we had that little potty humor, too, to help you remember that. Um, but, yeah, we know it diverges. We did it on the calculator. Let's go ahead and see why it diverges. I'm kind of curious, uh, analytically. Um, let's do this one multiple choice style. 
multiple choice style. So we don't need to write the limit. So uh, we're just looking for the antiderivative of 1 over x. Natural log of? Absolute value of x. Yeah, there was a question like this on the A-B take-home test. And, um, man, believe it or not, more people than not just put ln of x instead of ln of the absolute value of x. More people just put ln of x than did it correctly. And they all lost one point. All right, so now we plug in. We get the natural log of infinity minus the natural log of 1. You can drop the absolute values once you plug in. But in the antiderivative, you still need it there. Now, what is the natural log of infinity? It's infinity, and the natural log of 1 is 0. Is this a tug of war? Is this indeterminate form? Start with infinity, take nothing away. <laughs> that's not a tug of war. Right? That's infinity. So that's why it diverges. We've now proven it. We don't have to do it numerically, which the evidence wasn't, like, overwhelming towards infinity. Remember, it went from, like, 4 to 6 to 13 to 20. It was getting bigger, but not as quickly as you might expect. But we've just proven that, yeah, it's not a race. It's going to get bigger and bigger as forever and ever to do it, and it will approach infinity. Yes, Gorel. Uh, if, if that question is on a free response, here's how you would answer it. You would either do all this work but have the limit there instead of the infinity. Right? This is where they would take off points. So with the limited front, you would do it that way, or you would just say this is a divergent P series with P equaling 1, which is less than or equal to 1. You can actually refer to a P series. It is common knowledge. This is a divergent P series with P equal to 1, which is less than or equal to 1. Okay. You've got to identify the P value and then give it the inequality. If it was a convergent P series, you can't just say this is a convergent P series with P equal 1.1, which is greater than 1, because if it converges, they're going to ask you to find the value. Right. Okay, so those are easy to spot when you have infinity or negative infinity. Um, let's look at this one here. Let f of x be e to the negative 2x from 0 inclusive to infinity, and let r be the unbounded region in the first quadrant. Bounded below by the graph of f, um, find the volume of the solid when we rotate it around the x-axis. Oh, an application, right? We have a volume question, and it's a volume of solid of revolution. So this is going to be either a dish shell or a washer. So step one, let's identify the region. E to the negative 2x looks like that. And we're going from 0 to infinity. It's bounded by the x-axis. So here's the region. It goes on forever. And we're rotating that around the x-axis. Okay, how would you prefer to slice that, vertically or horizontally? Yeah, vertically. Uh, horizontal slices are going to be very, very difficult as you get close to the x-axis. So let's slice it vertically. All right, so now that the axis is horizontal and our slice is vertical, those are perpendicular to each other, so it's going to be either a perpendicular or a perpendicular. This is a perpendicular because the area is butted up against smoothly all the way across the axis. There's no voids. So this is going to be a perpen, and you don't have to write this, but I, I do on the, uh, on the worksheet keys, perpendicular. All right, so uh, the volume V, you can use V. What goes out front for the disk method? Pi. Pi times the sum of the infinitely thin slices from left to right, which is from 0 to infinity of R squared dx. And the radius is just that. It's from the axis to the curve, right? That's what we do for the washer method. It's the same thing for the disk. We just have one radius. So that's e to the negative 2x minus 0. I'm not going to even put the minus 0. All right, so now we just have to evaluate that. Hey, we just set up an indefinite integral or an improper integral, sorry. A definite integral that's improper. So let me go ahead and simplify this. E to the negative 2x squared is e to the what? Negative 4x. Yeah. Now, just kind of um, intuitively, is this going to converge or diverge? But this is e to the negative 4x. So it's going to the x-axis mighty rapidly, right? 
So whether we were stretching or compressing it, it should converge, right? It should converge. So we just need to evaluate it. So pi goes along for the ride. Uh, we'll treat it like a free response, actually. So let me back up. We got the limit as b goes to infinity of pi, the integral from 0 to b of e to the negative 4x dx. All right, so now, now it looks like um, free response notation. So we just got to rewrite that limit every time. Pi goes along for the ride. Uh, what's the antiderivative of e to the negative 4x? We have to have a correction of what? Negative 4? Negative 4, right, negative 1 fourth, yeah. The reciprocal of negative 4. And then, of course, it's its own antiderivative. And then we evaluate it from 0 to b. Looking good, looking good in the neighborhood. So we got negative pi fourth as our coefficient, beefy brackets e to the negative 4b minus e to the 0, which is 1. You can just write 1. And so now we evaluate it. We only have one term with a b in it. So kind of not surprisingly, as b goes to infinity, e to the negative 4b goes to 0. And I was getting a little bit nervous because I had a negative 4 pi in front. I know that volume has to be positive. But negative pi fourth then times negative 1 makes it pi fourth. Yeah. So... We were talking about unbounded regions that had a finite area. If you actually kind of think of what this is doing, when we rotate it around the x-axis, we're getting that something, something that looks like this. It looks like a, an infinitely long vuvuzela or maybe a trombone bell, right? That would be really hard to play. Um, if the slide went all the way out here, maybe the slide stays within arm's length. Maybe just the bell of the trombone goes out forever. Um, so here is something that um, if you turned it vertically, right, it would look like a funnel, right, and it would be an infinitely long funnel, right? But we just proved it had finite volume. So you could take that funnel that's infinitely long that has a hole in the bottom that goes on forever, and you could buy enough paint that would fill pi fourths cubic units of volume and you could pour that paint into that funnel, and it would fill it up to the brim. And yet it goes down forever, and there's a hole in the bottom, and it doesn't leak out. That is weird, right? That's weird. It's an infinitely long funnel or trombone bell, but it has a finite volume. Yeah, that's right. Again, when I learned about this in high school, I was just like, yeah. that was That's how I got to sleep at night, because I laid awake. How can it have a finite volume if, if it's a bottomless pit, right? Well, I rationalized finally what Colin just said. It just gets so small, the diameter down there towards the bottom, that the viscosity of the paint is so great it just doesn't go through anymore, and so it backlogs. It backs up and it fills up. But that's not really true. That just helped me get to sleep at night. Okay, well, yeah, rationalize it in your own mind. Right? Uh, I even got to a point one time, I'm like, okay, it goes on forever, but you got to cut it off at some point, right? you got to cut it off at some point, but not really. But then, then you lay awake at night, so whatever. Do what you need to do. This is not even the greatest paradox that we're going to cover. There's one at the end that's even greater than this, but hang on. We'll get there. So this one also, if we were to integrate it, it would also have a finite area. So that's not a big deal. It has a finite area, even though it's unbounded. It has a finite volume, even though it's bottomless. Okay, sweet. Excellent. All right, so there's an application. We can set it up as an integral to find volumes. All right, rapid fire. Watch out for indeterminate forms. Hi, okay. Integral from 1 to infinity of 1 minus x e to the negative x. Intuition tells you what? Converge or diverge? Converge. Okay, let's see if you're right. Um, since it's rapid fire, let's do these MC style, right? Not like MC Hammer style where we, right? But multiple choice style. Um, man, how am I going to integrate that? i got to find the antiderivative of that. Yeah, I heard it. What did you say, the D word? Distribute, yeah. So you get e to the negative x minus x e to the negative x uh, dx. You could do that. And now the antiderivative of e to the negative x, we, can, we know it's negative e to the negative x. What method is going to be required there? 
I got one factor that I can take the derivative of or the integral, and I got another factor that I can take the derivative or the integral of. Integration by parts. This one's integration by parts. Now, if I do integration by parts, what I've done so far is fine and dandy, but maybe instead of having one term that I can integrate, maybe I could just do the whole thing as integration by parts and save having to distribute. So let's do that. I'll go ahead and let this one, since it's the power of x, remember ideally when all things are possible, we want to let the power of x be the one we take the derivative of, so that's what we call u. And that way this one would be dv. And when we do that, then the powers of x's will get smaller and smaller and eventually hit zero. Now there are exceptions to that rule, right? If we have a natural log in there or an arc tangent or an arc sine, we only know how to take the derivative of those, so our hand is forced the other way. And those are the ones we typically tie off after one iteration. Um, I'm just going to do the tabular method um, instead of the backward zero method. So I got u, dv, plus minus. And uh, we got 1 minus x, e to the negative x plus. Okay, so the derivative of this is negative 1, and then it'll go to 0. So it's nice when we get to 0. So this one, we have a correction of a negative 1 each time. So it's negative e to the negative x, and then positive e to the negative x, and then minus plus. So the integral, remember the first diagonal. And if you don't draw uh, the arrows, you know, that's fine. It's going to be negative e to the negative x times 1 minus x. I just wrote it backwards. Uh, and then we go across and pick it up minus, and then it's the next diagonal product, which already has a negative 1. So if you can accommodate those negative terms in your head and multiply, that's fine. I'm just going to go ahead and put minus and then have the negative 1. And then I go across and pick up the plus sign. And then who cares what's next because it's 0 times it. So normally I would put a plus C there. But now I'm going to evaluate it from 1 to infinity. And again, because I'm doing it MC style. Otherwise, I'd have the limit out front. Okay, um, we, 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 we do. I would just rewrite it from the beginning. Technically, you can integrate it first with the one and do infinity still there, but then before you evaluate it, the limit needs to be there. So I would just say get in the habit of rewriting it from the beginning. Yeah. Okay, um, since I have an e to the negative x in there twice, it might be helpful to simplify a little bit. That becomes a plus sign. If I factor out an e to the negative x, and then I flip the terms around, like I do that one first, when I factor that out from itself, I'm left with a 1. When I factor it out from the second one, I'm left with minus the quantity 1 minus x. Would that be okay? I'm okay with that? Had to do two things there. I'm just trying to make it easier to evaluate. Uh, and now I think I'm going to take the time to distribute inside there because I get then a minus 1 plus x. Well, 1 minus 1 would be 0, and negative negative x is positive x. So that does make it a little bit easier to evaluate. Help yourself, help yourself. All right, so now when I plug in, I get uh, infinity. Oops. I get infinity times e to the negative infinity, which is z z 0 e to the negative infinity is 0, minus uh, e to the negative first times 1. Well, what the heck is infinity times 0? Indeterminate, right? Oh, my goodness. So guess what we've got to do? L'Hopital's rule. Yeah. Yeah, so so much for rapid fire, right? I think I'm going to go back to the limit here. I feel I feel a little more comfortable with the limit there. So... Let me go ahead and write my uh, integrand then as x over e to the x. And then I'll evaluate it from 1 to b. So that becomes the limit as b goes to infinity of b over e to the bth power, which you don't get to say that very much, e to the bth, uh, minus 1 over e. And now th this is why I wrote the limit. It, we're, we're accustomed to doing that in the limit form. So now when you plug in to this one, you get infinity over infinity. And so now I'll put infinity over infinity. And I'm going to go ahead and write that every time. Lop it. It's kind of cute. I haven't done that in years past, but I like it. Lop it. And so just in the first term, right, just in the first term, because we've already evaluated the second term, we're taking the derivative with respect to b. So the derivative b with respect to b is 1. I better write the limit again, sorry. 
limit as b goes to infinity of 1 over, and what's the integral of e to the b? e to the b, right? Minus 1 over e. So this is just but one way to do it. Now, when we evaluate it, of course, 1 over e to the b as b goes to infinity goes to 0. So we get 0 minus 1 over e, which is negative 1 over e, and that's the answer. Now, we also could have, once we set it up in this way, we knew that the top was linear and the bottom was exponential. Exponential goes faster, so we know it goes to 0. Now, is it possible to have a negative integral? I only take the derivative of the first term. I've already evaluated the second term. That's why I just highlighted it. I've already plugged in the 1. So I plugged in the top to get b minus I've already plugged in the 1, so 1 over e to the first. So the second term we don't worry about. We just are evaluating that first term, and it's only that first term we use L'Hopital's rule on. So sometimes when you're doing these improper integrals, L'Hopital's rule will show up. Quite often it'll show up. Now, in this case, a negative answer is okay because we're not finding volume or area. That would be kind of an incorrect answer for a volume or area, which has to be positive. So, yeah, that wasn't very rapid fire, but it was a great review of previous skills, right? Yeah, I like that problem. Rapid fire, let's just say that we're, we're using muskets, right? You fire once, then you got to, like, you know, Reload by dropping in, packing it, whatever, which is not very fast. Okay, um, whew, rapid fire again. Well, we better go ahead and just go back to the limit method because it looked like we needed it for L'Hopital's rule or we were more comfortable in that form. So 0 to b of e to the negative x sine of x dx. Okay, so uh, what's going to be the rule of integration here? You want to put the e to the negative x in the bottom? Yeah. Well, we're not even at the point where we're evaluating it yet, right? We still have the integral there to contend with. If the integral were gone and we were trying to evaluate it, then maybe bring it to the bottom. But I've got to get past the integral before I even get to the evaluation step, right? So that's first things first. I have to evaluate that, and that's going to be, yeah, integration by parts again. Um, this one doesn't matter so much which one you call u or dv. Because we can integrate both of them, we can differentiate both of them, and neither one of these are going to expire. Oh, no. You know what that means. That means that it's going to be a repeater. Okay, sweet. Which one do you want to call u? Sine? Okay. And so dv is e to the negative x, and we get plus. Then we get cosine and negative e to the negative x and minus. And then we get negative sine of x and a positive e to the negative x and a positive. And that's as far as we need to go. Because remember, if you have two factors and neither one of them terminates, they're both repeaters, you want to go down to a line where the horizontal product, that's how we tie it off, has the same, but for a sign, has the same factors as the original one. All right? So we'll tie it off right there. So we're going to need this. We're going to need this. Copy, we'll bring it down here, paste. So that is equal to the first diagonal product, which is negative e to the negative x sine of x. And then we pick up the next sign, which is minus. And then the next diagonal product is uh, e to the negative x cosine of x. And then we go across and pick up the sign, positive. But then... Um, we tie it off with the horizontal product, which is going to be, um, there's a negative there, so I'll just bring it in front. That makes that negative. The integral of e to the negative x sine of x dx. And, of course, that's still going from 0 to infinity. At this point, you could actually, let me kind of retreat a little bit. Let me just call that 0 to infinity take the limit back out of it for a second. All right, so remember now what we have to do, we have like integrals on both sides. So we need to combine them. So we'll see if we can do a couple of steps in one so we don't have to write so much. If I bring that integral across, it becomes positive, right? And I have an integral plus an integral, which makes how many of them? 
two of them. Well, I want to solve for this because that's what I'm trying to find. So once I have a two of them in front, a two in front, I'll just multiply both sides by one half. And so I get, I can go back to this now. The limit as b goes to infinity of zero to b of e to the negative x sine of x dx, it's going to equal one half. That's solving for the integral of negative e to the neg. Oh, my palm gets in the way. Sine of x uh, minus e to the negative x cosine of x. And then I can evaluate that from 0 to B. Rapid fire. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So now let's, um, let's, let's help ourselves again. Let's go ahead and, like we did earlier, on the inside, let's factor out. Um, you want to factor out a negative e to the negative x? Sure. Yeah. Negative e to the negative x. And that leaves a sine of x plus cosine of x. And then we'll evaluate that from 0 to b. You can put that inside the brackets. All right, so now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to bring this negative out front with the 1 half, just because I don't like negatives hanging around. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed the limit, didn't I? Yeah, I do. I do need to have the limit. So let me – good thing we have notability here. Thank you, Colin. Limit as b goes to infinity, limit as b goes to infinity, limit as b goes to infinity. Okay, sweet. Um, so I'll pull the negative out, and I call that negative one-half beefy bracket. Now, when I plug in the top, I get uh, e to the negative b power times sine of b plus cosine of b, close, close, minus, parenthesis, e to the zero power, which is one, times sine of zero plus cosine of zero, close, close, close. That's describing my daughter's closet. Close, close, close. A lot of close. Can we stop there on a free response? Because I'm exhausted. No, no, we can't. No. All right. But now, there's the limit as b goes to infinity. Here's the only term that has a b in it. So, the second term, as we already did, is, is already evaluated. So the negative one-half is there, and now we'll evaluate the highlighted part. E to the negative infinity is zero, I'll write that down, times sine of infinity plus cosine of infinity. Does that limit even exist? No, that's, that's not infinity. That's D and E by oscillation, right? Oh, my goodness. What is that going to mean? Minus, if we evaluate this, sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so that's minus 1. Holy moly. Um, what is 0 times D and E? Hmm. Yeah, cosine. That's D and E, not because it's infinity. If that were like zero times infinity, we'd have to loppy tau rule it. But that is like, that flat out doesn't exist. So that's like, um, what doesn't exist? Not unicorns. Leprechauns. Oh, no cougars exist. Right? That's why they're, they're there, and we just beat them. If they didn't exist, we wouldn't have a chance to beat them. Um, leprechauns. Leprechauns times zero is leprechauns. So undefined minus 1 is undefined. Undefined times negative 1 half is undefined. Guess what the answer is? Man, that's kind of an anticlimactic problem, isn't it? That was a lot of work for something that doesn't exist. Yes, that would be an acceptable one. But infinity or negative infinity would have been a preferred answer. So this one doesn't diverge. This one doesn't diverge by like approaching infinity or diverge by approaching negative infinity. This one is D and E by oscillation. All right? D and E by oscillation. So if you think about what's happening here, if we think about the graph, which this is kind of nice in hindsight, if you take the graph of E to the negative X and you reflect it across the X axis, what you do now is both of those are approaching zero, yes? you now kind of have an upper and lower bound for the graph of sine of x to oscillate back and forth. 
And as we go from zero to infinity, we're picking a positive area, which is then going to cancel out with some of the negative area. But because the height of the amplitude is getting smaller and smaller, it doesn't perfectly cancel each time. So we're getting positive numbers and we're subtracting. So the areas are like big minus small plus big minus small. We're having positive, negative, positive, negative, and it's going to go on for how long? Forever and ever and ever. And so that's why it's DNE by oscillation. We're adding positive areas and then we're subtracting areas, adding positive areas and subtracting areas. And you can't even make the argument that if we start with a positive number, then when we subtract the next region, because it's below, it's smaller, right? It's never going to cancel out that first positive. So then we're gaining more positive and we're not canceling it out. You can't even make the argument that it's entirely positive, that it's some positive number. That's not how infinity works. Yeah, you're right. And we don't stop, right? Yeah, kind of like a dance party. We don't stop, right? So, man, that was a lot of exciting work for for nothing. Wow, okay. All right, let's reload the musket. Improper integral. 2dx, if you don't like the dx there, put them off to the side. Over x squared plus 4x plus 3. Oh, my gosh, improper integral, right? So it's going to be the limit as b goes to infinity um, from 0 to b. I'll bring the 2 out front. Got it. All right, so... That's 1 over. What do we do at the bottom? The derivative of the bottom is 2x plus 4. That's definitely not the top. This is a good time to factor it. Now, if it factors into a binomial squared, it's going to be real easy. Pattern recognition. If it factors into the product of two linear factors, then it's decomposition by the heavy side cover-up method. That's what it's going to be, right? That's x plus 3, x plus 1. Okay, okay. So let's go ahead and set it up. This is what y'all learned in my absence by that nerd on the videotape. Zero to B. You have uh, beefy brackets now. Remember, you have to group your terms together with either parentheses or brackets. Okay, so uh, we'll get the coefficient or the numerator for X plus 3 by going up here to the line above, picking a negative 3, which makes it 0, covering it up and plugging a negative 3 in, and we get 1 over negative 2, which is negative 1 half. And then we'll get the numerator for x plus 1 by going above, selecting negative 1, covering up, plugging it in, and you get 1 over 2, so positive 1 half. All right. So in this case, you don't have to do this, but this is one that's going to end up being really nice. I can factor out the 1 half, 0 to b, and then I'm going to commute the two terms. Uh, the second term will now have a numerator 1, that's x plus 1, and then it'll be minus... 1 over x plus 3. So if I had have factored it the other way, I would have already had the terms in that order. Sometimes you're going to have the same numerator in, the, in both terms, but just differed by a sign. And sometimes you're not. But when you do have the same magnitude in the numerators, whenever you're factored out, you're able to do one last step at the end uh, that normally we can't do. So um, let's go ahead and evaluate it now. The limit is b goes to infinity. My coefficient in the front is now a 1. So when I integrate... Don't take this for granted. They're linear functions, but don't just like take for granted and just say it's always the natural log of the absolute value of that. Take the derivative and see if there's a correction. The derivative of x plus 1 is 1. No correction necessary, so it's the natural, it's the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1. Minus the derivative of x plus 3, also 1. So it's the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 3. Um, if that had been like 1 minus x instead of x plus 1, now you'd be a correction of a negative 1. Oh, we don't. <laughs> thank you. I don't know why I put dx. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I do need an evaluation bar. Yep, from 0 to b. Okay, and then if it were like 2x plus 3, now you'd be off by a 2. You'd have a correction of a half. So don't take linear functions for granted. So um, let's go ahead and evaluate it then. Oops. Good morning, Eric. We'll have to take a stand, and we'll pick back up after the stand. If you're listening at home, take a stand. I'll 
We'll go ahead and use direct substitution. Y'all can watch while we're silencing. All right. Thank you. When you plug in a B, you could drop the absolute values because B is greater than zero. So you know those arguments are positive. So get to this step, and we'll talk about it when Ms. Shriver is done. one over E. So it was natural log of three. So there you go. That one 
does converge. Now, going all the way back to the beginning, what would your intuition tell you? We're going from zero to infinity. There is no vertical asymptote at zero. The function is defined there. So this x squared plus 4x plus 3 is a transformation of what parent function? x squared. So we're going from a number a where the function is defined. It's not bigger than zero, but the function is defined there to infinity of something that is a family member of 1 over x squared. That would be what? Convergent or divergent? It would be convergent, okay? And we just kind of showed that it did converge. It converged to the natural log of 3. All right, so again, so much for rapid fire. But that's a great place to stop for today. Tomorrow we'll look at, well, <laughs> more integrals with infinity. And then we're going to look at negative infinity to infinity and how to deal with those notational-wise. Wow. And then we're going to get to some comparison tests, which are similar to some sequence and series tests later. And then, finally, more with infinity. Wow. And then, finally, and then, finally, we're going to get to some integrals that have numbers, but it's still improper because we have a vertical asymptote either on the interior or at an endpoint. So this section is pretty robust, right? And then at the end, we're going to get to Torricelli's trumpet. Okay, and this is going to be the ultimate paradox. This is the one that's really going to keep you awake at night, and you're not going to be able to reconcile it. I haven't gotten sleep since 1992. Okay. Huh? Uh, I will add questions to your test from as far as we get from 6.6. I will not put anything on your test. That is something we have not covered. So great question, Tyler. All right, you got about a minute left. Uh, make sure you get your local scholarships in and park in a proper place, not an improper.